welcome to the Afghanistan Project podcast. I'm Beth Bailey, and today I'm excited to bring on someone who many in this community know well. Uh, Sean Van Diver is a 12-year veteran of the U.S. Navy and the founder and president of the Afghan EVAC Coalition, which is an umbrella of multiple volunteers and professionals across the government and private sector who aim to fulfill the promises that the U.S. made to its Afghan allies. Today, we'll be talking about how the coalition came to exist and the crises or the crises and triumphs it's faced and two of the biggest struggles it's currently involved in, which are helping to save Afghan allies living in Pakistan from deportation by Pakistani authorities and passing the Afghan Adjustment Act. Sean, it's a real pleasure to have you on today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and excited to uh, talk all about my favorite subject, Afghan EVAC and the incredible people that we get to work with. I'm digging it. It's, uh, I think that's, it's really exciting to hear about the coalition from you firsthand because I, you know, we've had people on before who are involved, um, but I wanna hear the story from you of, let's go back to 2021. You know, tell me about when you started thinking about the withdrawal and what your role in it could be and how Afghan EVAC got off the ground. Sure. So I think, you know, I haven't really shared kind of how I got involved in this with, uh, with many folks. Uh, it actually started probably in 2013. I got involved with No One Left Behind. Uh, my buddy was the CEO at the time. And I, uh, I got, you know, it, it is a great injustice that it is not easier for our wartime allies to, uh, to realize their American dream after their service. So I got involved a little bit back then. Um, was on the advisory board here in San Diego, was loosely involved in the chapter here. Uh, and in 2017, when President Trump announced the Muslim ban, I called together as the head of the Truman National Security Project chapter here in San Diego and founder of that. I called together a press conference uh, asking the president to reconsider. Uh, and we brought in a bunch of the different folks that would be impacted, including uh, two interpreters, one from Iraq, his name was Wolf, and one from Afghanistan, his name was Lucky. Uh, Lucky and I didn't know each other before that. Uh, we became fast friends. And, uh, and through that civic engagement, we got to know each other. And fast forward to 2021, in April, when, the pre when President Biden announced that he would be withdrawing all US forces from Afghanistan, the local paper, the San Diego Union Tribune, asked me to help pull together some opinion pieces from folks that had something to do with it. So I wrote it as a veteran and as a national security leader in San Diego. Lucky wrote it as an Afghan SIV. Uh, and we had a, several Afghans and Afghan veterans uh, from both the military as well as frontline civilians. So the intelligence community, diplomatic corps, et cetera. Uh, as we were writing that, Lucky shared with me that he'd be going back to Afghanistan. And I said, dude, what are you doing, man? Like, it's so dangerous for you there. And then I thought about it a little bit. And if you told any, any of your viewers that are from Texas, if you told any of them that Texas is going to go away in six months and you have a date certain, well, every one of them would put on their belt buckles and go in their boots and go back. Right. So that's what Lucky did. And, you know, we didn't chat every day. Uh, and then in August, when, uh, when the Taliban started storming through Afghanistan towards Kabul, I reached out and said, hey man, are you okay? Like, do you need anything? Um, and he, it took a couple days. It was August 14th when I heard back from him and I was sitting at my computer. Uh, I was starting and I was in orientation for an executive MBA at the University of San Francisco where I had just finished my master's in public uh, leadership. And he sends me this message that says, brother, I'm stuck. On I had to go up to the top of this mountain to get cell service. I'm stuck in Ergun, which is eight hours outside of Kabul. We're surrounded by the Taliban. I think I'm going to die. We grant my last wish and help get my family back to San Diego. And my heart broke. And, you know, most of the people listening to this podcast had a similar experience. So I, we had an exchange like, where's your family? This, that, and the other thing. Are they in Kabul? Are they there with you in Ergun? And then he disappeared. And I thought he was dead. So I was trying to get his family and the one friend that they had with them uh, into the airport. And I got dropped into probably 12 different chats. There were Truman chats. There was an Operation Eagle chat where Jack McCain was there. 
uh, there was uh, 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 Allied Airlift. At that point, it was called something different. There was, you know, the, the, literally at least 10 to 12 Team America <clears throat> evacuate our allies. And I have a background in emergency management, and I have a I have a master's in homeland security, a bachelor's in domestic security management, and I spent a lot of time working on counterterrorism and emergency management in the Navy and then at PlayStation when I left the Navy. And um, my biggest fear, my biggest fears were that one, all these people that were standing up to help would cause harm because they weren't talking. Or as we've seen, there would be people trying to scam vulnerable people and those that were helping them. So uh, probably around the 17th or 18th, uh, I said, we need to get everybody talking. I talked to Jack about it. And I said, look, we need to we, we need to do a few things. We need to make sure that this stays out of the, it does not become a political football, right? This has to be bipartisan. This is an American promise that we made. Republicans, Democrats, and everybody in between have made this promise. And we it's on us, if we're gonna be diving into help, it's on us to make sure that it stays that way. Because eventually the election's gonna come and eventually one side or the other is going to try to mold this into whatever bullshit they want to say. And that it's unconscionable to do that to these vulnerable people who stood beside us. Um, and he agreed. And so I pulled together this coordination call and there was like seven groups, Team America, Evacuate Our Allies, No One Left Behind, we're all there. Uh, and we started doing it at 5.30 in the morning uh, Pacific time and 5.30 in the evening, uh, or I'm sorry, 6 and 6, 6 a.m. Pacific and 6 uh, p.m. Pacific, because that time worked for the East Coast, that time worked for Kabul, that time worked for sort of most of the people, the, the concentrations of folks that were running around. And nobody was fucking sleeping then anyway, right? So uh, we started doing that. My I told my employer, like, I'm not coming back to work for a little bit. Like, I got to... I got to do this and like dare you to fire me essentially, but they were wonderful. Um, they were very supportive. Uh, I got us a, I, got, I was able to borrow some office space in downtown San Diego and I moved a bunch of monitors in there, a bunch of computers, had a bunch of AV and that's where uh, Jack McCain and I worked out of with a team of folks around us, including folks like Congressman Juan Vargas and his chief of staff who came to volunteer, Congressman Peters, uh, our DA, uh, a bunch of the local elected officials were diving in and asking how they could help. And two days after that, I was moving a monitor into my office, and I get this message from Lucky that says, hey, brother, I made it to Kabul. I'm like, what? And I won't bore you with all the details. They're, they're very exciting details, but we'll tell that at another time. Um, he had made it. He had gotten, we, we had helped him get uh, onto the, the airport and then the, the worst part of the journey began, right? They were giving folks an MRE a day. Nobody knew what the hell was going on. It was a really poor plan. Like, I'm not going to sugarcoat. August was a shit show. And, um, you know, Lucky was able to share with me a lot of that stuff. And so, look, Lucky really inspired a lot of all of this. Um, once he was safe, I couldn't just walk away after we built this, right? So um, most anybody who's in the coalition knows of March Bishop, she got like she had found me around the 18th or 19th we um we put together a communications workshop and that's where the coalition was really born because i thought that like the names were stupid i didn't want to like this was going to be a two-week effort we just needed to help people we didn't like we weren't trying to do all the things um so by that weekend the the first call was probably like on a tuesday by the weekend there was um a good like 30, 40 groups. And so we brought them all together and we said, hey, look, we're not digital Dunker, right? This is not about the military. This is about Afghans, this is about our allies. The military had 20 years to get this right and they fucked it up, right? And like, that's a hard thing to hear for a lot of us who served, but it's real. And so, no, we're not gonna let the military be in charge. No, we're not gonna make it about the military. What we're gonna make it about is these Afghans, these vulnerable people who served beside us, who upended their lives and are now being left behind because of the luck of the draw. So we decided our name would be Afghan Evac, not something like Digital Dunkirk. We bought the, we bought the URL, we got a 
got a um, a logo going, and there's a little surprise about the logo that we'll talk about after the Afghan Adjustment Act passes. Um, but then it was born, and we just kept doing those those meetings. Team America led an intel brief for us. Um, we kept going, kept going, kept going, and we didn't really engage officially with government until September. Uh, we, uh, you know, uh, the chairman had met with a lot of the more like the special operator types, and we got into that meeting and and we helped take that meeting from very narrowly focused on Afghan special forces to focused on the whole issue. And that's when Afghan EVAC's partnership with the State Department was born. And, you know, about a year later, we had an MOU and, and we've accomplished ridiculous amounts of things, which I'm very proud of. But it's because of the, the people power. It's because we are a cross section of America. It's because we have everybody from you know, hard left to hard right and everybody in between and people that don't give a shit about politics at all. And the commitment is that we're focused on these Afghans and we're not focused on ourselves. We're not focused on whatever political pot shot we can get. And, you know, there's been some there's been some of that here and there, but we've we've stayed the course and we've made sure that people stay focused. And we're yeah, and I'm very proud of it. It is really amazing. It was a long answer to your question. With what? I said that was a long answer to your question. Oh no, it's a great answer, and it's it's something that I see all the time in the people that we have on here. You know, we do have people from across the political spectrum, and it's it's the one refreshing thing about everything exploding after the withdrawal is that it it's something that actually brought people together again after so much, uh, you know, so much hate and discontent in this country, very real hate and discontent for several years. So let's talk about some of the wins and, you know, the, the difficulties that you've faced, because obviously when you're doing all of this on your own as an organization, it's going to be there are going to be a lot of difficulties, especially as you're trying to, you know, get read up on, I'm imagining, you know, humanitarian parole and yep. all of the issues that came with that and priority one and priority two and all the SIV issues that were already ongoing for years under Trump, under, you know, when a, a very narrow period of time under Biden, you know, all of these things that you guys are now having stacked on your shoulders what what were some of the let's start with difficulties that you faced sure look there's a few things right like managing personalities has been one of the shittiest part of this like everybody wants to be in charge but nobody's in charge right i'm not even in charge i'm just a dude that has a good network and and has some focus on this um you know, we rolled out a code of conduct at one point and there were people that had been the reason why we were releasing the code of conduct and they didn't want to sign it because that meant that they couldn't continue being chaos agents and just doing whatever the hell they wanted to do. Um, it's really hard to take on the White House. It's really hard to take on the federal government, right? And, and it's really hard to do that in a manner that balances both the importance of, of making sure that all of the voices are heard, all the voices have a chance to be heard. We're not gonna make all the voices heard if the voices aren't doing their homework and, and, and ensuring that they have the baseline level of knowledge that they need. But we're, we're giving an opportunity to everybody to make sure their voices are heard. And there has to be a level of trust because our model is that not everybody can come because not everybody can talk. Everybody wants to talk, right? So we get a representative sample and, and it takes a long time to build up that trust that we are in fact carrying their voices there, right? And, and balancing that with like having to have, you know, hard conversations with government without, without causing undue embarrassment. And like what I found which I, I, I've been struggling with trying to figure out how to help everybody see this. And I think other, like, I think we've done a good job of this, but I'm, I'm not sure is all of those things you talk about learning about P1, P2, learning about HP, learning about SIV, learn like all of these volunteers that have, have been doing this government was learning alongside them, right? Like this has been a shared experience. Every bit of it has been a shared experience. I mean, every piece that we've all learned together the government had to learn too and and they felt helpless also 
and they felt helpless in a way that they couldn't air their grievances. So that that has been interesting. And then balancing the very real political truths that like politicians don't like to be called to task, right? So how do you do it in a way that you can call them to task while also getting them to do what you want them to do? Um, and, and, and what you want them to do is built through this iterative process with a big group of people, right? So if you get them to do what you want them to do, you, you still need to get them to do more. So you can't have this zero sum game of just like burn it all down. Um, that has been challenging. And then uh, sort of operationally, like passports have been challenging, right? Like everybody, like the fucking Taliban, right? Like the Taliban has been a big challenge. And sort of when we think about what the big challenges are, and I'm not going to get into too many operational details here for obvious reasons, but when we think about the big challenges, Afghan EBEC exists for a couple different reasons, right? One, we want to increase capacity and throughput faster and more. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Becky Zimmerman in a meeting one time said, we all want faster and more here. And I seized on it and I said, yes, that is exactly right. We want faster and more. And it's never going to be fast enough. And it's never, it, and until we get every Afghan who served alongside us and it is not a security threat, it's not going to be enough. Um, and then the other reason is to reduce uncertainty, right? So a lot of the challenges have been of the government's own making. Shitty communications coming in and, and telling everybody like, hey, you've got to get out of Afghanistan and then we can process you. I'm like, oh, wait, but not to Pakistan. Oh, wait, not here. Oh, wait, not there. They left that part out and they wouldn't give a... A roadmap, and they can't do that for a lot of different reasons, right? Diplomatic issues, liability issues, who knows? Um, and look, the challenges have been many, and they've changed over time. Uh, I mean, it was a challenge for us to get in the door and get taken seriously. That challenge was taken out pretty quickly, um, and, a, and a, a big reason for that is people like you, Beth, like journalists who care about this for one reason or another, whether they serve there or whether they have friends that serve there. Journalists continuing to write about this, showing the political powers that be on the left and the right that Americans care about this. Americans from a wide swath care about this issue. And, you know, I, I do need to say that it has been my experience that I haven't met somebody in government that doesn't care about this and doesn't want to do a good job on it. I've met people that are apathetic. However, those people have been run right out from their own peers, which, I mean, we had an issue where uh, somebody in a State Department meeting one time wrote a note when our people were in the room that said, like, these people suck. That person got thrown out that day. So who sucks now, motherfucker? Uh, <laughs> So anyway, yeah, the fucking Taliban has been a challenge, passports, capacity and throughput, and then managing personalities. And, and like, look, I come from the Dem side, right? I've been a political activist for a while, and I, put, I took it upon myself to go and fight with the leader of our party, the leader of, you know, the, the people at the White House. And, and then I would come back and get shit on, like, you're a, you're a Biden plan or you're a Trump plan. Like, okay, whatever. Um, so anyway, I'm nobody's plan. I want to push on that, too, because, you know, I think many of our listeners know that I come from the right side of the aisle. But I'd love to give you a chance because Biden has taken so much flack for not caring about Afghanistan. And I know that you have sat with him and talked to him yeah. about this. And I, what I would love is to hear what does he say to you and what do you see like sh sh that is him actively doing things that maybe we just don't see in the media that are going on behind the scenes to really improve this process so that by sure. maybe have a moment of you know vindication for all i know that i have certainly been unimpressed with what has <laughs> been happening myself but i'd love to hear that from someone who sat with him Sure. So, yeah, look, I'll talk about both President Biden and his the senior leaders in his administration, and then I'll talk about members of Congress as well, right? And look, the fact is, if we have a scoreboard for who's putting up wins for Afghans, the administration is batting probably like 500, 
600, 700 maybe. They're doing a lot. Congress is batting zero. And way back in August and since then, members of Congress from the left and the right told us they stand with us. They want to help us. They want to do good. They believe in this. But all you need to do is look at the look at the reality of the Afghan Adjustment Act and see who's a co-sponsor and who's not. And a lot of those Republican members of Congress said they stood with us and they are not there. And so if you have a friend that's a member of Congress, call them and make sure that they're either a co-sponsor. So there's no waiting list for Republicans to co-sponsor. There's a waiting list for Dems uh, because we want to make sure that this is bipartisan. Uh, call them up. And look, I could give you a list of the things that the, the Biden administration has done. Um, I'll list off a few of them, right? Uh, one, we told them we'd like to see 5,000 people leaving a month. They set that goal and they're getting pretty fucking close to it. And I'm, that's all I'll say about that. But they've built the infrastructure so that this relocation ecosystem can continue on beyond the administration until the job is done. They've changed policies. They've relaxed some rules around, um, relaxed some of the more harsh rules around uh, accessions because this is a population we want to say yes to rather than say no to. Like the, the default is to say no. Um, they've, they've looked for really creative, uh, really creative mechanisms for getting in there, right? So like if you go to our website, afghanevac.org slash policy, you can go through on our policy goals and you can see the dropdown. There's check marks next to everything that they've done, right? The, the very first thing they did that we asked them to do was to appoint a special assistant to the president to, with tasking authority focused on relocation resettlement efforts. You'll remember that there was a coordinator in the White House working on this. Well, a coordinator doesn't have tasking authority. Uh, so we asked for that. And right after we released a letter to the president in December of 2021, that happened. That person was Curtis Reed, who was appointed. And I, I have to give him a lot of credit. That man is a hero. Full stop. He has given so much of himself to make sure that these things are happening. He's pushed departments and agencies where they didn't want to change. And he's uh, made sure that, that Afghans are getting... That I, and there's still plenty of work to do, but for example, he had a lot to do with the general licenses that came out of Treasury. He had a lot to do, we asked them to develop and communicate an end-to-end risk-based multi-year plan with redundancy. They did that. We asked them to approve the relocation of P1, P2 referrals from Afghanistan. They did that, right? Before it was, you can't be relocated if you're P1, P2. And they said, well, you know what? You're particularly high risk if you're in Afghanistan, we can do it. Now they're doing it in Pakistan too. Uh, which we asked for. We asked them to direct the establishment of additional processing sites to incur increase capacity and throughput. They did that. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, when we get to sort of our wins, I'll talk about another one that's been massive. Um, and then I like, look, I could, I could spend this whole podcast listing the, listing what the administration has done. And you're right, they don't get a fair shake on it, but also that's the breaks, buddy. You're in government. Like you got to keep going. You got to keep moving, right? We're not going to stop until this is right. We want to see remote processing. We want to see all these things. And also Congress could just do it. And Republicans in Congress, if they were on board, they could just do it. So when the president called me, president, I, I've interacted with the president probably four or five times on this issue uh, here in San Diego, there in DC. And then he called me one time um, in August of 2022. And he asked me, he said, Sean, like, what else do we need to do? And I gave him a list of, you know, we need more product, we need faster and more, we need to reduce uncertainty. You need to make, you need to be very clear in what you're saying to Afghans and you need more capacity. And he committed to all of those things and all the things he committed to on that phone call, he's, they've done. So, I mean, they, they do deserve some credit there. And, and I'm very proud because, you know, I don't have the faith that they would have done all that without this wide cross section of America pushing for it. Um, I just, I'm very grateful. I don't agree with how August went at all, 
but I'm very grateful that the administration has, even if they won't come out and say it publicly, um, has made it very clear that they're in this to finish the job. Um, and I'll say, you know, I've had private conversations with senior, mid-level, and junior folks across the administration, and there's a there's a great deal of of regret around how how August went, and and you see it in how the government leaders are showing up and breaking themselves to do this. You see it every day. We see it every day when we like nobody has to talk to us, right? We we're not paid. This is all volunteer. There's no contract that we have with state. We have a memorandum of understanding that can be cut off at any time. The secretary, secretary Blinken, I mean, he got up and told everybody that I was kinetic, which you can translate to, I've been kind of an asshole to them. Um, but they care about this, which is important. And so, you know, it's really easy for us to sit back and say, State Department doesn't give a shit, or the White House doesn't give a shit, all of these things. That's just not my experience, it's just not true. And when we let our anger drive that and shut down those pathways, shut down those doors, close those doors, it all it does is serve to like provide salve for our wounds, but it doesn't do a damn thing to help Afghans. And so every time I get pissed off and I like, I've had some moments where I've, um, I've, I've had some moments uh, as the, our State Department and DHS friends can tell you, uh, and DOD, but the mission matters more. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible, all of these things, because they are, you know, these are highly specific things that you are seeing. And if that weren't there, if you guys weren't doing this, you're right, the Biden administration wouldn't know what is needed, wouldn't be able to make those changes that maybe aren't, you know, earth shattering to somebody who's looking on from, you know, way over not really understanding all of the complications, but I mean, those are, these are all really important things and it, that gives me yeah. some hope and I'm glad that you guys are doing that work. Uh, you said that there was something you wanted to talk about in your wins column. So let's go yeah. there. I mean, we're, we're on a high, let's just keep going to some wins. Well, look, the story of Afghan EVAC is the story of civic engagement, right? Like this isn't, no matter what some folks would tell you, we're not kicking in doors, you're texting people. You're not on the ground in Afghanistan, running and gunning. That day's over, and although it helps serve some of our trauma to talk about it like that, that, that shit is done. And so this is a story of civic engagement. This is a story of, of folks from all across America being involved in a way that we haven't ever seen before, and in a way that our near-peer competitors could never do. Our near-peer competitors, you know the countries, could never, ever stand up a distributed network of thousands of people align and start rowing in the same direction. And like, how do you, how do you combat that? So that's a big win. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we do so well is that we bring the reality on the ground with evidence past the bureaucratic bullshit, the, like the morass in the middle, the, the immovable middle, right? The majors and uh, lieutenant colonels. And we go to the flag officers and the senior political appointees and the president himself and, 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 right? We're able to bring reality to the highest levels, the highest decision makers in government. And, and that's a big win. And one of the ways that we did that is we helped people at the White House, people in the National Security Council, understand that shitty communications, like NBC communications, like ASIP communications, like PRM communications, like a lack of communications, like very confusing USCIS websites rather than simple, easy to understand, digestible things. We're like 70% of the problem, right? Like there are all these pathways that people could get into, but nobody fucking knew how to do it because it was confusing. So on one hand, we created all these infographics, we helped people understand it, but I went into the White House and I said, hey, one way that you could solve this permanently rather than depending on a whole bunch of volunteers who are already stressed out, this shit is hard. We had to stand up a 24 hour watch, a 24 hour resilience duty officer program that's since gone, now it's 988, but we had to stand up a 24 hour watch because this was so hard and people needed somebody to talk to. Um, depending on volunteers is a pretty shitty way to do business, but we are happy to be adding capacity, right? So we said, do this, we called it a comms audit, comms alignment, like whatever. 
put a spreadsheet together, figure out every communication that goes to Afghans, who it comes from, why, like what the impetus is, what you're trying to accomplish, what are the relevant policies, and what other communications are impacted by this. And it took a couple months, but they agreed to do it. NSC directed it. And, you know, Afghan EVEX co like coalition members have since gone on to work, and now they're not in the coalition. Right now, like, they can't both be on our team and at the State Department. So folks like Jessica Bradley Rushing, who uh, went and is now uh, in charge of engagement and analysis, she ended up leading this for the State Department and has crushed it, and it has made such a big difference. We, uh, we got to pay a visit to NBC after they had done their, their portion of the alignment. We brought in a bunch of other volunteers across the coalition, and the, the new 60-day message went out. Every 60 days, there's like a, hey, this is what's going on. And Jessica showed it to one of the other volunteers who, who were, interacts with a lot of SIVs, and she cried because it was like, yes, this is what we've been begging for. And so, like, it is massive. We can talk about the family reunification form, right? Like the DS-4317. It took a year to launch, and that was so frustrating. In the interim, Afghan EVAC launched a form. We got an agreement from state based on our MOU that, that they will take this in and action it until they get their form launched. So we were able to like use some you know, creative thinking, and, and it took a, a pretty hefty push from us because it was – like, it would boggle your mind to know how long it takes to launch it. something as dumb as a form, even though this had high priority because family reunification is a big priority. Um, that form was a big win. And then getting the feedback to the folks at state on that form in an actionable way. They're going to be launching a public inquiry portion to it so that Afghans can go in and find out what's going on with their case. That wouldn't be happening without us. Like, it, it is... Every Afghan EVAC coalition member that hears this or anybody from another coalition or another group of folks that is listening, the folks in Afghan EVAC have done such an incredible job. And the only way we've been able to do it is because it's such a wide cross section, because their voices matter to senior leaders in government. That's really incredible. Um, you guys really have had a lot of wins and they are things that, like I said, they're just so intricate. They're so, because you're so intimately understanding of yeah. the scenarios from this high and low level, it's, it's amazing. I was going to ask you this at the end, but I think this might be the more appropriate time. I mean, this effort, it's new. Like you said, it wouldn't happen. Our near peers would not be able to do this. What, what role do you see something like this happening in the future like or having in the future in, in things like, you know, we have Israel cropping up right now and people trying to get prepared to get out of Israel. We had Ukraine, like, does this kind of effort scale or reorient to different kinds of conflicts as, as needed, do you think? Or is this- Sure, I'll, I'll keep this one relatively short. I think there's a few things you have to think about with that, right? You have to have some magic ingredients Magic ingredients are a wide cross section of people care about it. Can't just be like one group or another group. Uh, two, uh, there has to be enough of those people to make it to to you know make it matter. It can't be ten people. Um, and one thing that I think the U.S. government should do is think about how the and, and I know that they are. Think about how this all sort of came together. How do you how do you not over manage or over engineer how do you identify the right folks to lead um and it's hard, like the government can't do that like nobody in government identified me right like i went in and said hey man we're fucking doing this get on board or we're gonna you know we're gonna break you here and here and here and um and fi but figuring out how to have appropriate guardrails on what you can and can't do right like there was there were people that did some really crazy shit and put at risk i mean there's afghans in places that they have no business being right now because somebody wanted to be a hero and didn't want to take the time to think through a full plan or validate it. Or they tried to hold it close and like, I can solve this. I'm like, no, man, you need to... Everything that we do in this space has to be done with an eye towards what is the worst that could happen to these Afghans. And, and they need to make the decision, right? We can't make decisions for them. Immigration advice should not come from anybody who is not an immigration attorney. 
I mean, you, you heard it very early on from us since day one, what Afghan Evic was saying is, don't give anybody immigration advice if you're not an immigration firm. Do not fly somebody somewhere unless you have a, a, unless you have funding and a plan for their ultimate disposition. Make sure you're not making decisions on behalf of Afghans. And check your ego at the door. This is about Afghans. This is not a place for us to grandstand. It's not a place for us to become famous or not a place for us to, you know, like there's a reason why we haven't written a book or, or done all those things, right? We're too fucking busy still doing this. And the story's not over. Yeah, and I will say, because I, I did volunteer with uh, one evac org in early 2022, I'd say, and, and I remember, and, and that was when I was getting tons of messages. I've, I've since not been able, I can't even keep up with it all, so I no longer am able to answer messages from Afghans every day, but I was at that point, and I was close to burnout, but it was really hard in their defense when you have somebody who is certain that they're going to be killed or that their daughter is going to be, you know, taken by their ex-husband and forced into marriage with the Taliban and like all these things. And how do you, and it was so hard at that woman, the woman who would contact me about her daughter and she's still to this day is concerned about what will happen to her daughter. She fled illegally to Pakistan to avoid her ex-husband taking her daughter and giving her to the Taliban, like he was threatening to do. And she would ask me, well, should I go to Iran? And I would say, no, if you have P1 or P2 underway, don't do that. Don't, and also just don't do that. Look what's happening. It was, it's so hard. Yeah. And I can understand why some people have thought, oh, well, we'll just go here. But really yeah. nowhere has been friendly to Afghans. And that hurts my heart so much because Afghans are lovely people and they have found unfriendly situations so many places in the world. And I think that brings us really to Pakistan, which is why I wanted, you know, you've been so, Afghan EVAC has really been at the front of this. And for our listeners who aren't aware of the intricacies of this current situation in Pakistan, uh, the Pakistani government has said that they are going to do a three-part deportation scheme. There really aren't too many details other than that the first part of that scheme is removing 1.7 million illegal refugees from the country Their deadline to leave was November 1st, I believe, or October 31st. And we saw people getting sent out in semi-truck containers and dying, um, people, children being beaten by the police, just horrid images in the news of what was happening. And before this, you guys were already motoring into protection mode because no one to date, unless something has changed, has said what will happen to protected Mm -hmm. Uh, Afghans who are, let's say, trying to get a P1, P2 in the, you know, humanitarian parole pipeline or with requests in or uh, SIV eligible and waiting on determination there and who are in Pakistan. So can you back up and tell everybody when Afghan EVAC got involved in this and why and kind of how that has evolved? Sure. Um, so Afghan EVAC has been pushing on Pakistan for a long time. We've been having a lot of conversations about it. Um, you know, a, a lot of Afghans fled to Pakistan because the United States government told them, like, you got to get out of Afghanistan if you want us to process P1, P2. Um, and a lot of folks have been taking care of folks there, have been trying to make sure that they're uh, getting the, you know, that they're legal that they have housing there. But the, the reality is that Pakistan hasn't been a really um, forward leaning friend. Uh, they keep coming up with new requirements, this, that, and the other thing. So we sort of, once they announced this, this, um, once they announced this policy, they, we saw the writing on the wall. So we started organizing, we, we did a letter from a bunch of senior government officials and advocates from across the ecosystem. Uh, we sent it to Pakistan. Um, they did not respond, but we heard that they were very upset about it, which fucking good. We are upset about the way you're treating Afghans. Um, we, you know, Afghan EVAC does not like to engage with other, with foreign governments, right? That's not our job. That's the job of the state department. Our job is to push our government. Our job is to make sure that everybody across the ecosystem is working from the same set of facts. Um, and you know, the reality is that it's not, and this goes for the whole ecosystem. It's not August 2021 anymore. We can't operate within like gray areas. 
we can't treat it as though there's a ticking clock of August 31st. It is urgent. It is not emergent, right? Like it can't be an emergency for three years or two years. It's very urgent. And one of the things that we try to help folks understand is like there are processes in place, there's this, there's that. Now with Pakistan, with that looming deadline, it felt like that wasn't really the case, right? So we worked with State Department, we worked with other parts of government to make sure that um, what we were doing wasn't gonna cause harm. Like we wanted to make, I said, hey, we're doing this letter, like that, that's out of the bag. Like we wanna make sure that this doesn't ruin anything. Um, <clears throat> and nobody threw any red flag. Uh, we sent the letter over and we didn't really get any response. Um, but what we know to be true is that the entire you know, the entirety of like the folks that are related to this in the US government are working on this every day. The highest levels are engaging Pakistan on this. Um, you know, we asked them to open up an RSC. Um, they've sort of ignored that for a long time. Like, you know, fingers crossed that eventually happens. That's the only way they'll get them out at scale. But we haven't heard anything back on that. Uh, what we have heard though is the State Department launched this hotline, uh, which went really well. They, you know, we launched a form, they launched a hotline, together we're, we're able to identify when incidents are happening. Um, and State Department has been working really hard to make sure that folks who do get caught up in that are not deported. And they've seen a lot of success there. Um, they've seen a lot of success in, as I understand it, they're working, they're talking to Pakistan every single day. Um, and I can't get too deep into a lot of the stuff, but you know, we don't want to fuck up diplomacy, but, um, it has been a real shame that Pakistan has done something like this. However, I am very proud of the work that the, that our government leaders have jumped in to do. And I'm proud of the work, the outcry from the international community. UNHCR wrote a letter, other parts of the UN wrote a letter, other groups around the world wrote letters. Um, Congress has sent both public and private letters to the Pakistani ambassador, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, et cetera. Um, we've seen some really extraordinary stuff happening. I hope that this problem set evolves into something that is workable and manageable. Um, but I think for the first time since August, a lot of us have felt really helpless and it's been really hard to it's been really hard to like stomach this idea that uh, Afghans are very vulnerable there. And, and although there's been, you know, some parts of Pakistan that said, Oh yeah, they're fine. We're not going to kick them out. There's been harassment and beating of children and all these other things. And it, it's really, really sad. And you know, just this fear that is being sown, all this uncertainty and fear causes real, very real physiological responses. And people don't deserve that. These folks are just trying to seek a better life. Absolutely. And it's true. I mean, there are people who are getting kicked out now who've been in that country for decades, trying to escape war, just trying to be in a safe place for their children, you know, and it's, it's definitely heart wrenching to see that. But especially, I mean, if you are engaged in this problem set, I, I can almost guarantee that you've been getting emails or Twitter, you know, contacts from people who are saying we're P1 and P2, and we haven't been processed. And you know, Sean, you were the first person to finally tell me several weeks ago that the reason that the processing wasn't happening the way that it could be is because Pakistan was dragging its heels yeah. on RSC, which for listeners who don't know that acronym, it's Resettlement Support Center. And so that's where P1 and P2 processing occurs. And right now it can't occur right where those people are. And, and it's just, these are people who've been waiting already yeah. they were told 12 to 18 months to process your case yeah. and without that place to process well, the case they can't exactly yeah. and look the reality of this is there's been refugees in the u.s rep pipeline for 20 years right like these folks are going at lightning speed for what it is but it's not fucking good enough and while we're taught why you know I, one of the biggest ones that i left off is afghan evac worked with the white house and the u.s digital service and others to streamline the US rep processing at CAS and elsewhere. It's, it's spread to several sites around the world and hopefully will be global soon. What, took, what takes 12 to 18 months in most places or longer can now happen in 30 to 90 days if you're on one of the processing sites, right? Like if you're, if you're there, because you can do all of the things at once, sort of like a starburst rather than uh, one of the big problems is you you 
do it, you do it in a linear fashion and things would expire. So you'd have to start back over and it would take, they, it was just aggravating. So in a meeting one day, I said, well, why don't you just do it all at once? And Curtis Reed went and drove that. And now, holy shit, like this is a massive win. That just wouldn't have happened without us. And, and people, because I'm sure a lot of people are hearing that and thinking, oh, well, if you're taking that short a time, this can't be that great. But this is not, you know, I've, I've always heard that P1 and P2 processing is the gold standard for yes. vetting and making sure that yep. the individuals who are going to come here are not security risks, are yep. absolutely who they say they are. And so it's really astounding to hear that. And, you know, as we're looking, you know, I wanted to ask you, it, it doesn't sound like this is the case, but have any U.S. allies been um, put in harm's way yet under the new deportation scheme, or has that not really been seen? Several have been detained, but as far as I know, none have been deported. As far as I know, I, you know, I'm not on the State Department calls. I'm not a lot, like I'm not government. They don't tell me, like I don't get to know anything that's classified. I don't like I don't get that information. Um, we, the ways that I operate is generally, if one of our people knows something, I can go and validate it and then I can know it. Right. Um, and so, so far they've been harassed, but not deported, which is terrible, but also, I guess a, a silver lining. Um, and look, the reality here is that refugee processing does take a really long time and there are global crises. You mentioned a few of them earlier. And, you know, we're going to keep saying it's not soon enough, it's not fast enough, but like there is a patience factor to it, which sucks. And I wish it was better. And I wish that there was more funding, but I also understand the legal reasons why you wouldn't provide housing for people until they're vetted and you wouldn't do all, you know, do all those things until there's at least some level of, of certainty that they're going to be coming here. Um, but I will say that there's a lot of enterprising folks in government that are looking at every angle of this and trying to shave off a few months, a few years, a few days here and there. Um, so I'm, I'm very confident that this job is going to get done. And I'm very confident that the folks in government who are working on it are competent and capable. And I wasn't always confident, confident of that. I can say the same thing. And it is, uh, it's like you said, it's no longer urgent or it's urgent, not emergent. You know, it's yeah. this, okay, now I, the, things I get from SIVs stuck in Afghanistan rather than being, I'm going to die tomorrow. It's like, man, I'm really tired of waiting on my comm approval. And I'm like, well, that's, yeah. we can handle board waiting on comm approval. You know, that's, yep. that's something that I can feel like I'm, you know, my heart goes out to you and I hope it's faster, but I'm glad that you're not in direct risk anymore. Um, well, one of one point I want to make around that is that we as advocates, we as, as, People call them shepherds. I don't really like the term shepherd. That's weird. These are not our sheep. Um, we are not, these are not our Afghans. These are vulnerable people that we're getting the hand to, but Afghans have done all of this work, right? The Afghans are the ones in harm's way. And so if we're going to help them, we have an obligation to learn about the things that we're talking about, to be really sure and to not be wrong. Because us being wrong, if we're wrong, that can directly impact some of these immigration tests, their entire lives, the lives of their children, their grandchildren, et cetera. Um, some of the ways that we've tried to address that is we have afghanevac.org slash resources. There's a frequently asked questions. There's a P1B2 thing, an interview ready guide. There's even a caseworker guide that sort of walks through all of the history, all of the immigration stuff, all these things that if, if you're listening to this and you have not seen that, but you work in this space, Hurry on over to afghanevac.org slash resources and look at it. It will help you. You need to look at it. You have an obligation to be as smart as you possibly can on this and to operate within the systems that exist now. If we want to create new systems, by all means, let's talk about it. Let's go make it happen. But we can't be doing shit that's going to put people at risk. It's not August of 2021 anymore. There's no more like, like look the other way. Yeah, absolutely. And I have heard many of those stories from individuals who did, you know, I'm going to go cowboy and yeah. do things that, that might have ruined cases, um, unfortunately. But that remains to be seen. Um, 
And let's do the last thing we wanted to touch on was, well, I have two things. The last one, I want you to talk about the volunteers who are behind you. But first, before we do that, I want to talk about uh, the Afghan Adjustment Act. Because, sure. you know, it's something that in the media, it keeps popping up. Oh, the Afghan Adjustment Act is up. It's up. It's up. And we hear all these amazing and brilliant Afghans talking about how they've come here and they don't have a path forward. Or, you know, th th there are so many aspects of the AAA. So can you tell the listeners a bit about what that is, why it still is just getting kicked around and not passed, and your feelings, which I know are very strong about the issue? Yes. So thank you for asking this question. The Afghan Adjustment Act is a really important uh, bill that is kind of the, the one thing that Congress could do to put their money where their mouth is, right? There's a whole bunch of things about the SIB process, the P1, P2 process, our immigration system writ large, and an opportunity to offer some more oversight. Now, there's a lot of negotiation happening right now between the House and the Senate and the administration, et cetera. Uh, I'm not gonna get deep into those things, uh, but I do, I am hopeful that by the end of this year, the Afghan Adjustment Act should pass. If it doesn't pass by the end of this year, I don't think it's gonna pass. <clears throat> and that's unfortunate for a lot of reasons, but um, every Afghan that's here in the United States, if I were if I were them, I would have already applied for asylum uh, because I just don't trust that Congress is gonna get their shit together on this, but we are hopeful that they will. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's in there. Uh, there's support for Afghans who are outside of the US, right? Like they would want an office in lieu of an embassy which would help get a little bit closer to Kabul, uh, a presence for contractors or whomever, not an embassy, none of that, but um, certainly uh, something where we can sort of see what's going on on the ground. I would love to see uh, a presence from the United States government on the ground in Kabul that does not normalize relations with them, that does not recognize them, uh, doesn't recognize the Taliban, but does allow uh, ongoing efforts there to continue. Um, I would like to see a requirement in there around uh, response to congressional inquiries. I'd like to see an interagency task force. Um, I'd like to see the, the, the meat and potatoes of it is this adjustment of status. Every other time we've had a conflict and we've had to bring people here in mass, uh, like 80,000 Afghans, um, a lot of those Afghans are SIV eligible or some in some other way eligible to come here. They, a lot of them would have been eligible for P1, P2, but once you get here, you can't be a P1, you can't be a refugee anymore. So they're in this limbo. They're here on humanitarian parole. That runs out, it's already run out. The administration had to jump through a ton of different hoops and good on them for figuring out a lot of different ways to make it good. But until Congress acts or until these folks get asylum, which is an onerous process that's long, it's really hard and it's stressful, there's no guarantee. Uh, these folks are sort of stuck here. And what it would do is it would allow them to apply for a green card to become a lawful permanent resident after a certain period of time and then be on a pathway to citizenship, right? Now, it's important to know that these folks have no home. Afghanistan, we don't recognize the government of Afghanistan. Afghanistan doesn't exist anymore as a place where we can send somebody back to, absent really, really, a, a really high mark. There's a policy of non refoulement which means like you can't send people back to a place that's not safe for them. Um, and the Afghan Adjustment Act would allow for that. Uh, but it would require, so anybody who's ever said like, we're just not sure about the security on these guys. And there are several who have said that and not co-sponsored the Afghan Adjustment Act which is weird because the only way to get that sort of refugee level vetting, that gold standard <clears throat> is through this bill. Um, then uh, there's uh, additions uh, to either, there's been talk of whether it's SIV or P1, P2, probably should be SIV, um, but adding additional categories, right? So there's a lot of folks that care, like Congressman Mike Waltz talks all the time about the uh, Afghan Special Forces. He was a Green Beret. He served alongside a bunch of these folks. The FTPs, there's a bunch of folks that talk about the female tactical platoon members. They would all be eligible 
to come in through this bill. And yet we don't see a lot of those folks on this bill. It is mind boggling. Um, there's a lot of different folks, and this is the thing that really pisses me off. Earlier I talked about the scoreboard between the administration and Congress. <clears throat> there have been members of Congress that have been absolutely incredible. Scott Peters has been, like he's, he officiated my wedding, he's a dear friend, and he was my congressman when this started, and he has been um, a sounding board when I was like taking on the White House about the State of the Union or other things, right? Um, and like going pretty hard and worried about like, what the fuck is going on here? He's been like, my shoulder to cry on has been amazing. Congressman Juan Vargas. Congressman Peter Meyer has been really amazing. Uh, he's a Republican who's now running for Senate. Um, there's been a litany of them that have been really good. And I'm not gonna name check anybody here, but you know who the fuck you are. And there were so many people who told us they would stand with Afghans, they would stand with us, they would stand with the veterans, the frontline civilians, the advocates that worked on this. And they're nowhere to be found, other than on cable news talking shit about this, but refusing to act. And frankly, that's cowardly, it's un-American, and it's bullshit. And we see your bullshit. If you were there, if you were moving people around, if you have people that are here on HP now, because you were reaching out to us, or you were reaching out to the State Department, <clears throat> or you're in meetings now talking about how you're a big supporter of relocation, and you're not on this bill, then you're full of shit. Get on board, baby. We can see, we can see you, and we have receipts. So it's very frustrating to me that there are folks that have not been on the Dem side. I wish more Dems would talk about this, would be out there and pressing and pressing and pressing. Uh, on the Republican side, I wish there were more people that would get on board than them. Now, I think I would be remiss without talking about Senators Klobuchar, Coons, Graham, uh, and, and several others. Uh, Senator Blunt was amazing last cycle. Um, we've seen a really remarkable group of folks. Representative Miller Meeks, <clears throat> uh, Rep Zach Nunn, who's a member of the coalition, uh, he's a he's a member of the coalition from Iowa. He's a Republican congressman now. He wasn't in Congress when he joined. He's been amazing. <clears throat> there are bright spots. But what we need is Chuck Schumer, Mitch McConnell, uh, uh, Mike Johnson, and, uh, and Hakeem Jeffries to ensure that this thing gets done. And in order to do that, we need to see a bipartisan, bicameral, uh, group of folks driving on this. So uh, that's the Afghan Adjustment Act. I have hopes that it will pass, but if it doesn't, then we'll retool and we'll figure it out. Um, we're going into an election year and I beg your listeners, I beg everybody listening to this and who's going to talk about this, make sure that your representatives do not use this as a political football other than to say we have an American obligation to get this right, to finish the job, to honor our promises. It's an obligation that we all made. It was made on the backs of frontline civilians, of junior and mid-level enlisted and officers, our sons and daughters who we sent off to war, and the world isn't getting any safer. So we're going to have to do that again someday. And our sons and daughters, our grandsons and daughters, need to be able to look their, look our wartime allies in the eye and say that we have your back. And we cannot do that if we turn it into a political football. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for all the veterans that I know that, you know, Michael and I have talked with who feel such moral injury from, you know, the years that they put in and, and the failure to act so far on so many of these promises. Um, it's just, it's such an important. Yeah. It's such an important moment, such an important, you know, I hope that the AAA gets passed and that mm. people do stand up. And that, like you said, I think the problem is, it's, it's like you said earlier, uh, there are a lot of people who've said those things and haven't acted on them. And, and with politicians, yeah. you know, what's, when are you getting lip service and when are you getting somebody who's already yeah. demonstrated that they are getting this? 
what's so wild about this build is I've never seen some shit like this. It is so well, uh, so well negotiated by, I mean, Lindsey Graham and Chris Coons, Lindsey Graham and Amy Klobuchar, Amy, they both ran for president of their respective parties. <clears throat> they both ran for president of the United States from their respective parties. You're telling me that this bill isn't bipartisan and good for everybody? I mean, it, it is wild. And it answers the mail. It answers all of the mail that people have, have brought up. There are folks who only care about the Afghan special forces who aren't on board with this bill for some reason. And, and like, we have to care about the full swaths, right? But those people in particular need this bill to succeed. We've got to make sure that we honor our promise and get this thing done. Yep. I am 100% on board with you. Well, the final question I have for you is that, you know, you get to be the face of Afghan evac everywhere that you go with all these senior leaders that you're speaking with. And, and there's this huge group of volunteers who are also involved in this effort who you get to you know bring that home to and i just want to give you the chance because you have spoken so eloquently about them before to just kind of do a shout out to the people who are enabling this fight without whom you know you couldn't do this on your own it's absolutely well i'm gonna i'm gonna be very clear we have a policy of not outing anybody that's not publicly out there so i'm not gonna name i'm gonna name one name but uh i'm not gonna name a lot of names uh, but I will talk about groups and I will talk about this incredible group of volunteers that has, I mean, leading this effort has been the pri privilege of a lifetime for me. I often say this is the most American thing I've ever done. And I served in the Navy for 12 years. And I, I have to tell you, eight months after January 6th, where we're at our most divided, where this, the fever pitch of division in our country is on display for the whole world to see. Eight months later, this group, this incredible group that ranges from children's book authors to police officers and firefighters and diplomats and people within the administration, people from the last administration, uh, frontline civilians, diplomats, intelligence community professionals, teachers, professors, every kind of, every part of the American experience is represented in this coalition of more than 250 groups from all walks of life, from all income levels, um, who are working together, heads down, so, you know, some are big personalities, some are quiet, grinding it out, getting the work done. We try to do a really good job of making sure that we're able to pull everybody up and get everybody's opinion. And some of the most remarkable things I've ever seen have been how these folks hold each other up and the little groups that they make, the friendships, the, the lifelong friendships. I mean, on our Afghan evac team that made, like administers the coalition and um, and you know the other efforts that the nonprofit has, uh, we've created lifelong relationships, lifelong friends. Nobody's paid. There are groups within the coalition that are paid, but nobody from Afghan evac is paid, and nobody um, nobody from most of the organizations that are still grinding it out every day are paid. And there's something uniquely American about. That. Right? There's something uniquely American about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, getting up every day, helping people that you've never met or people that you've met once or twice or people that served alongside you because it's the right thing to do and demanding from your country that we deliver on the promise of America, that we deliver on our American values. There's a statue in the Bay in New York, in the harbor, that says, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. And that is something that I see embodied by every one of these coalition members who have a lot to be proud of. You know, we've, we've tried to take some action to make sure that all those coalition members know that they're appreciated by both their federal government and by us and by their local government. We've, we made sure that uh, coalition members got a letter from the Secretary of State. We made sure that um, we put together a few events and people have gotten to go to those events at the White House and at the State Department. We've asked their local elected officials to recognize them. Um, we've also given tools to a lot of the groups. Now we can't force everything and we can't, we can't spend all of our time trying to get recognition for our members, right? We, our job is to focus on Afghan. Uh, but we're trying to give people the tools to succeed. Everything needs to be sustainable because we want to go away eventually, right? Like we want this to just work. So we're trying to create all these sustainable toolkits to ensure that, that organizations are able to recognize their own members. 
And so we want people writing op-eds. We want people making their voices heard. We want people going and getting their city councils like we've done here in San Diego and LA and elsewhere to do a resolution supporting the Afghan Adjustment Act, do a resolution supporting Afghans, do a resolution recognizing their group or Afghan EVAC as a broader movement or whatever. Light up your civic infrastructure to show Afghans that your community stands with them. That piece right there, that's the reason we did that letter for Pakistan, right? It wasn't, that was a, that was a note to Pakistan. Uh, that was a note to Afghans, right, rather, that went through Pakistan, but we made it public very quickly because we wanted Afghans to know that powerful people in America stand with them and believe in them and want them to be safe. We've written letters to the Afghan diaspora. I wrote a letter to the family members of all Afghan EVAC members. Um, and we've done other things here and there because this shit is extraordinary. What these people have done, and sometimes there's been mess ups. And sometimes, you know, we've, we've tried to make sure there's, that everybody has all the tools they need to succeed. Sometimes there's been tensions, but it's all in the service to a greater good. It's all in the service to people who stood with us. It's all in the service to a country that we broke. It's all in service to making sure that we're, that we're doing a little bit better job living by our American values, doing a little bit better job ensuring that people know that civic engagement can make the difference. And if I leave your viewers and listeners with anything, it's get involved. No matter where you come from, left, right, center, know what's going on in your community. Whether you're showing up at City Hall, whether you're protesting, whether you're, you're running for office or getting involved in some way, Afghan EVIC is just civic engagement at the global scale, right? You can do this anywhere. Your government leaders have to listen to you. They want to listen to you. And sometimes you got to do a little bit of stuff to force them to listen to you, but, but it works. All of this that we've done together, all these, like all the policy things, that's, that's not what matters. What matters is that all those policy fixes result in us being able to go down to the airport and welcome our wartime allies who stood with us and have been begging for the chance to come here. It's for guys like Lucky who Lucky's now a small business owner in Texas and Oklahoma. He's running an Afghan halal market in both places and he's opened a restaurant called Afghan Meat Market. And he's a pillar of the community there. Those stories are all over the place. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention one, one person in particular, March Bishop, who was sort of like the, she's my co-founder of Afghan Evac. Um, she came in, you know, about a weekend and, and unfortunately, we had to lose her on the day-to-day -day because she became the coalition liaison at state. She helped build care. So she couldn't work with us anymore. She had to go over there. But, I mean, Afghan EVAC helped build care. We are so fucking proud of, every, of, of everything that has happened because it results in a new American promise for Afghans who deserve it. That is amazing. Uh, you're so on fire for this. It's so great. I'm yeah, especially now, you know, with two and two plus years on and we don't hear as much about Afghanistan anymore. And it's just so good to know that there is still this groundswell of people who really care. And um, I do want to close. We close all our episodes usually with a letter from an Afghan, just because that then it's one thing for us to talk about what Afghans are going through. I think it's a totally different thing for the world to hear straight from, you know, the heart of an Afghan, what their experience has been. But unfortunately, we are out of letters from Afghans. And so I want to tell all our listeners, whether you're in the States, in a third country, in Afghanistan, we want to hear your stories. We don't care how they come, if they're in a poem, if they are in a song, if they are in a really lengthy, detailed letter. We want to hear everything about the parts of your experience that you want the world to know about. And you can send those letters to the Afghanistan Project podcast at gmail.com with um, let us know if you need a pseudonym. We are very happy to scrub personal details to keep you safe and keep your name out of it. Um, but I think that those letters really show what's going on. And then, you know, Sean, oh, go ahead. I see, I can tell. Yeah, I, I actually randomly got a letter yesterday, yesterday, 
Yeah. 20 hours ago, I got a letter from somebody. I'm happy to read that if that's helpful. Hey, that's awesome. Let's do it. Um, I'm not going to use his last name. Uh, this is from a man named Wally. Said, Dear Sean, I hope this email finds you well. This is, well, this is Wally, an SIV applicant. I safely reached America on November 2nd, 2023. I'm right, this is going to get me. I'm writing to express my heartfelt thanks and deep appreciation for the invaluable support and guidance you have provided me during the process of relocating to the USA. Your assistance has been instrumental in making this transition a smooth and successful one. From the moment I expressed my intention to move to the USA, you have consistently gone above and beyond to help me navigate the complexities of the relocation process. Your willingness to extend a helping hand and to share your knowledge has made a significant difference in my journey. With severe gratitude, with sincere gratitude, and his name, and he sent a picture of him with his two babies right outside the Capitol. It looks like he's in D.C. And I've never met this man before. He's talking about Afghan Eden. He's not talking about me. He's talking about our volunteers. He's talking about the products that we put out, the information that we put out. And I gotta tell you, I've had occasion to visit places like Camp Asalia in Doha, and there's nothing that gets you going, like seeing a family arrive, seeing a family depart, or seeing just the relief wash over folks when they get here. Um, I will ask your volunteer, ask your listeners to make sure that they're not leaving folks once they get here, because it's hard when folks arrive. The resettlement system is not easy. Yeah. And they need your help navigating here. And you can make a big difference volunteering here at home with your resettlement agency. Um, I love that you read a letter at the end. And I, I'm grateful that you let me read that. So thank you, Beth. Oh, it was a, the perfect ending. Um, I can't think of a better way to end that episode. And, and you're so right. I mean, I had the opportunity. I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast yet, but I met the interpreter that um, Michael helped. It was Michael's interpreter um, a couple weeks ago with him. And, you know, it's just amazing to know that they're here, but definitely the struggles, the language barrier, the children trying to adjust to a new culture, like they don't, they'll never complain or just the difficulty of getting signed up for electric or switching electric from yeah. one residence to another once that yeah. you know, the resettlement support agency has kind of gone away because they've been here for a certain length of time. Like it's very difficult, all these small things. And yet they're just grateful to be here yeah, and exactly. not be at risk anymore. And so it is something that I want to talk about more on the podcast. You know, I've focused so much on people yeah. stranded and Thanks. yet there is this whole resettlement aspect that's very difficult. And yeah, I, I want to hear more of those stories so badly. So Sean, thank you so much for talking to us about this really important work that you guys have been doing now for such a long time and the hope that you're bringing to Afghans like Wally and, you know, all this work going after the Pakistani government, not really after the Pakistani <laughs> that government. That won't be visiting Pakistan. No, oh God, no. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you guys are just doing a great, a great service and thank you for being here to talk about it. Yeah, look, might as well push, right? We got to keep pushing. We gotta keep going. These folks have des these folks have earned it. They deserve it, and we're not going anywhere until this job is done. I love it. Well, to all of our listeners, thanks for sharing your time and supporting the people of Afghanistan, Tasha Kaur, and we hope to see you again soon.